Hello world and welcome to this edition of Tech on Fire with Blaze. I'm Blaze Stewart, architect at Winelect. Today we're going to be looking at Kubernetes services and controllers. Today we're going to be talking about Kubernetes controllers and services. Now this doesn't apply specifically to Azure, so it can be applied to any cloud, but Kubernetes as a design has something called controllers and the controllers are basically system pods that control the behavior of other pods on a given Kubernetes cluster really within the context of a Kubernetes what we call namespace but the point of a controller is to have an application running in pods and it has a way of manipulating the pods in such a way that the application will run according to the design of the controller and the controller is going to give the application some kind of desired state and it's going to make sure that the pods that are defined by a desired state are going to be running as such and if something goes bad say you one of the pods crashes it's going to try to restore the given set of pods to a desired state now you might be starting from scratch with no pods and it's designed to get you from nothing running to a desired state as well so controllers are essentially what control the behavior of pods once a pod is defined and that is how kubernetes is able to support many different kinds of applications it's not specifically debate for microservices but you can have applications that have a database component and you want to use a database with a web front end well a controller can ensure that the database comes up first and, and it's running in a desired state before the web front end comes up so that that dependency is met when the web front end comes up so that's what controllers are intended to do in Kubernetes, there's a bunch of different kinds of controllers. Uh, one of the most common types in the early days of Kubernetes was the replica set. Now, a replica set is designed to maintain a set of identical pods up against a given quota. So I need 10 pods of this type. So I would define a replica set to maintain 10 copies of a given pod. Now, it does attempt to distribute that work across the nodes in a load balance for fashion so that you can get high availability and so on within that replica set in the event that a node goes down. And replica sets were the original attempt at doing this, and they've generally been deprecated in favor of two other kinds of controllers, mainly replication controllers, which added some uh, functionality to the original replica sets and deployments. Now deployments are probably the most popular of these three nowadays within the context of Kubernetes because it allows you to have replicas and a given replica set with rollback options in the event that you need to go back to a prior state and maybe there's bad code, there's a bad version or something of that nature. Now the next pods we're going to talk about, the next kind of controllers we're going to talk about are slightly different uh, for different kinds of applications. The, the state set controller is designed to manage ordering for applications so that you can ensure that a given a service in your application comes up before the next one comes up. So in the uh, example I just mentioned within tier, maybe you have a database that you need to come up before the actual application comes up. So with a stateful set, you can manage that ordering as well as provide uniqueness to the pods that are deployed. And this was a very useful one for more traditional apps, while deployments are really useful for things like microservices. And some additional uh, controller types that are popular are daemon sets and some other was ones that we'll mention in just a second. But a daemon set is basically a set of pods that ensures that a given pod will end up on every node or a copy of that pod will end up on every node in your cluster. So if I have 100 nodes that on my cluster that are running my workloads, then a daemon set would ensure that every one of those nodes has at least one copy of my pod. So if, the, if one node goes down, it doesn't attempt to move that to another uh, node, that pod running in that given node, but rather it, it would attempt to just shut it down. But if I add some additional nodes to my cluster, the daemon set would then ensure that those new nodes get a given pod as well. Jobs are very popular for running things like batch processes and long running jobs on Kubernetes. So what this allows you to do is create a 
a pod that has a container in it that is going to do some processing, uh, start the processing, and then run it through to completion, and then shut it down and report back a result. And this is designed for things like big data workloads if you need that. And there's a lot of things that you can uh, program into uh, jobs to ensure that I want three instances of this to iterate on this data set or something like that, run them from beginning to end, and then shut it down. It's not going to attempt to um, maintain a replica set at 24 by 7. Rather, it's going to attempt to make sure that that the desired state of this is running through to a completion to a desired outcome from the job as it runs inside the pod. And then lastly, there are cron jobs, and these are jobs that run on a schedule. So basically something like a task that you need to run on a timer, say every you, every week or so I need to run a report or uh, every day I need to run a report or I need to update an SSL certificate every month or something like that. Cron jobs are what you would use to do those kinds of things on a Kubernetes cluster. Shifting gears and let's talk about services for a minute. Now, a service on Kubernetes is basically a way to expose your replica sets or your deployments or whatever it might be that you have in a controller to a network. So you can do that to a private network, to a public network, to a public IP address. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Now, basically what the service does is define something that will define a behavior for the kube proxy, which is a pod on every container that is responsible for acting as a load balancer as well as exposing things like a port to a given replica set or deployment or whatever it might be so you can have multiple pods exposed through a single point of entry so whenever i have something coming in from the cloud it comes and hits the kube proxy first and then it's going to load balance it say to one pod then the next request comes in same path and it's going to a, a secondary pod and a tertiary pod and so on and then if i have a, something coming out coming in on another IP address, it would end up going to this replica set over here in this application. So you can have multiple applications all running on the same cluster, and depending on how you define the services, will determine how those end up getting deployed onto your Kubernetes cluster and exposed to a public endpoint, whatever that might be. There's a couple of different service types we can talk about. The one of them that is kind of most confusing is the load balancer because it's called load balancer, although they all do load balancing of sort. Now, what this attempts to do is expose your application through a load balancer that is external to Kubernetes. So basically a external IP address will be created that a load balancer can be uh, initiated against in front of it so that you can have traffic coming into your application that is load balanced in a public IP facing an external network. The next one is called a cluster IP. And what this attempts to do is get something exposed on the ex in internal network of the cluster. So the internal network of the cluster is provided by a network plugin and its internal IP address will be exposed as a single point of entry for all the pods that are running in a different replica set or application that can be used by other pods on that given cluster. Now, load balancer is external, cluster IP is internal. So that's kind of the differentiator between the two. However, they're both doing load balancing. So that's somewhat confusing, although the nomenclature is not exactly clear there. And another third type that is common in kind of on-premise systems that I've seen is a node port. And this will attempt to expose a IP address on, an, on a given node through a given port number. So I want to port uh, like 3306 on a, on a node on a given node, it will use the node's IP address, but the actual port will be reserved for a given application that's exposed through a node port, but it still does the same kind of load balancing that a cluster IP does or a load balancer would do as well. When we talk about defining the desired state of a given controller or service, we use either declarative on the command line through parameters, or you can use a manifest file. Now, typically, this is going to be done through a manifest file because there's a lot of things you have to set inside of Kubernetes, and that would be hard to do on the command line. So generally speaking, use, a, use one of these YAML files to define your services or your deployments, whatever that might be, replica sets, and uh, so on. Now, I'm going to look at an example here that's a pretty basic example for exposing a given application on a given port, and I want to have a deployment where I have multiple instances of my application running in pods. So the first thing that we're looking at here is this section, and it is defining a service, and this is what it gets exposed 
to a network uh, of some kind. So basically, this is what's defining my load balancer here. So when I define this, I say I want an API version and I talk about what kind it is. So this is a service like we talked about on the deck. So that kind basically tells Kubernetes that this is the controller for this particular kind of proxy that I want to have here. Now, I have some metadata here that define it, basically the name of it and some labels. And these are used for something called selectors, which you looked at down in an example down below here when we look at the spec. But this is important whenever we go to defining find services and deployments on Kubernetes so that Kubernetes knows how to identify things. Now, the spec here defines what ports that I want to expose and the kind of exposure that I want. So in this case, I'm exposing an HTTP application. I gave it a name HTTP that doesn't determine anything about the protocol. It's just the name I gave it and it's using port 80. So I want this to be exposed on port 80 and it's going to be targeting a backend port of 3000. So it's basically going to be do some port mapping from an exposed port of port 80 to a backend port for my pods running on port 3000. And I'm to tell it to use a type load balancer now the type load balancer as we recall is an external ip address for my given ad load balancing here so basically what this is going to do is assign my service to an external ip address in the case of azure kubernetes services it's going to go out to azure request a public ip address and then bind this service to that public ip address now remember i talked about selectors just a second ago this is telling me what I want to expose, which brings me down here to my deployment. Now, the deployment section in this is a deployment controller that is defining my application as I want to run this. So a deployment is basically a replica set with rollback options. So in this case, I want to define a application that is going to have three replicas running uh, at, on it. And I'm going to give it some metadata so that it knows how to select this. So it's giving a label called app that is used by this selector up here so that the target port, the, the, the specification up here on my service knows where uh, to expose this particular uh, service uh, deployment down here. And then down here in my spec, I'm also defining my container. So this is where I get down into the weeds and start defining things like containers. Now, a given uh, spec will define the containers in the deployments here. And this is basically going to define the pods that are deployed to a given um, replica set or given deployment. So my, my template here says uh, I have a single container inside of this pod and this using this as a template. So I have my image here and I, there's, uh, I have an image pool policy basically telling it to always pull this image every time I restart it or deploy it. So in case of changes in the image itself, and that's going to be getting a uh, image from Docker Hub that I've uploaded already. And down here is the name of the, the container that I want to use, and it will post pin this with some kind of ID against that. Then it's going to tell it what ports to use. And this is using port 3000. And if you recall up here, that's the port I wanted to target port. So this is telling me, uh, the selector is telling me to use this uh, deployment right here. And then this target port is telling me to map port 80 back to this container port down here, which is port 3000. So that links these two up. Now down here, I have basically the same thing replicated over again. I'm just using it for a different application. So inside of my manifest file, I actually have two services defined and I have two deployments defined. So when I go to deploy this, it will actually create two services and two deployments. And we can go into the CLI and look at how that looks I'm here in my CLI and I want to deploy that YAML file to my Kubernetes cluster that I created on Azure. And I've already connected my client to Azure. And I have a video on how to do that, uh, that we did last time we looked at containers and Kubernetes on Azure. So to do this, I'm going to use the kubectl um, command line interface for K Kubernetes. And this is the the, uh, the API, the actual CLI that you can use to interact with the API controller on Azure Kubernetes or any Kubernetes cluster. And I've used the Azure CLI to configure the credentials for this. So if I do a kubectl create, I can create a bunch of services based on a file, which is the service deployment YAML that we looked at in the text editor. And this will create a bunch of pods 
deployments and services that I can use the kube command to kubectl command to actually look at. So if I do kubectl get pods, I can see all the pods that are running. So I can see in this particular one that I have a couple that are creating and then a couple that are actually already up and running. If I run that again, they might already be ready. So all of them are currently available for use. So I define th two replica sets, or sorry, two deployments with three replicas in each set. So I have a total of six pods that I have running in this particular uh, configuration that I have. Now I can do get deployments to show the deployments that are controlling these pods. So I have node app one and node app two, and they have three of three that are ready. So the desired state is three replicas in each one of these deployments. So I have a total of six, as we saw when we did the get pods command. And then I can do get services, and this will show me the, um, the exposed IP addresses for my given application. So currently it's pending, and uh, that's because behind the scenes, Azure Kubernetes services is requesting a public IP address from Azure. And what that uses is a service principle to go out there and provision something using the Azure resource manager. And once those become available, they will show up here inside of my external IP. So we'll wait for those to come back. So after running the command a couple more times, you can see here that I have both of my IP addresses available and I should be able to open these up in a browser and get my applications that are defined by my deployment. So let's open up a new tab here and let's drop in the IP address for this. And let's see if I can get uh, node app one. And uh, it's going, basically all the traffic's being routed back to the same pod. Uh, so let's go ahead and get the, the second one, the second IP address for node app two here. So there's node app two, and let's go back over here to my uh, new tab here. And there's node app two. And let's see if I can refresh this. It's all going to the same pod as well. So the load balancer is, uh, it seems to be redirecting everything to the same pod, but in a different scheme, we might get traffic being redirected around Robin or to uh, sticky sessions, depending on whatever those might be. So there we have another one being directed to another pod there. And if I refresh it a few more times, maybe I'll get it. I don't know. It depends on the lottery that I get. So it's going back to the original pod now. So you can see here that I've got some load balancing going on, but for the most part, it's always going to one of the pods that is in my given deployment. And that's basically because of the, the load balancer and how it's working behind the scenes. But all in all, what we've seen here is a deployment of services and a deployment of pods to a Kubernetes cluster so that we can expose those applications to the internet using any number of different schemes as defined by controllers. If you like this content, please consider visiting us online at www.wintelect.com and there you can find about services that Wintelect offers including training and consulting services. Also, please consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the subscribe button and clicking the bell icon to get notifications when new content becomes available and also comment down below. You can also follow me on Twitter at the one mule and also follow Winelect on Twitter at Winelect now or at Winelect. We are constantly posting things about Azure related technologies and things related to software development. You can also reach us by email at consulting at Until next time, thank you. Thank you.